But Acts chapter number 17, we'll begin reading in verse 16 together. The Bible says, Acts 17, 16, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but, to e but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with its inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. Lord, I thank you for the word of God, and I thank you for how you meet us where we are. I thank you for revealing yourself to us, um, and not only in creation and our conscience, but through Christ and the scriptures. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would do that this morning for those that are watching, those that are listening. Um, God, I pray that you'd stir us and speak to us about the lost, but Lord, my, you know my heart and my intended target is for those that don't know you. And at least this morning, that would be the case. And I pray that you'd use your word to bring people to an understanding of who you are and your love and your care. And God, I pray that you'd just draw people to yourself. Help me as I preach. Give me wisdom. Give me clarity and your Holy Spirit's power. Lord, I need you. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we would understand this by now. No matter who we are, we need God. <laughs> America's greatest need is God. Um, we can't help but watch just a few minutes of whether it's the local news or the national news uh, without getting a little bit aggravated or getting discouraged. I know that's me. Um, I, I can't watch too much of the news before I get um, pretty hyped up and aggravated with stuff and frustrated at things that I really can't personally fix. Um, it's, we, you can listen to politicians uh, weasel their way around the truth and try to give a least truthful answer without getting in trouble. It's aggravating seeing people, even folks that are supposed to be on our side, refusing to take a stand. And then they, and they quickly sit down if they do take much of a stand. Um, it's aggravating seeing people that proclaim to have high morals um, not and lead in a way that's far from biblical morality. Um, a, away from the news, it's, you know, if you, we kind of learn these things through the news, but through higher education, through universities and colleges, and even down uh, to elementary schools, um, I know just some of the children that have come to our church um, talking about stuff that happens in their schools and their libraries. Uh, it's frustrating to know the filth that's being pumped into their hearts and their minds, um, and they can't really get away from it sometimes. Um, not all schools are that way, but some are, sadly. And we can get angry. I know I get aggravated at stuff. Um, or I can flip the switch off and kind of become numb um, towards some of the things that go on. But that's not the right answer either. America is suffering because our people um, as a whole have been, long, have been for a long time straying away from God and straying away from the Word of God. The problem that America has today is the same problem that the Apostle Paul found in the city of Athens in his day that we just read about. We'll talk about that this morning, but when Paul arrived in Athens, he found a people that were not absent of religion. Though, if you look up statistics, especially since the 1990s, uh, those that claim to be irreligious or not believe in God or whatever that means, whatever they would mean by having no religious affiliation, that number is greatly increasing as far as those that don't go to church or follow God. And there's a million reasons we could probably come up with as to why that is. But America is a religious place. People that don't claim God or don't claim to have a God are still religious. They still believe in something, some power, usually themselves. Um, but when Paul gets to Athens, he finds a people that are very religious. Verse 16, now while, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him 
when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. If I, I, that word stirred, I was thinking about it. I think it's more than just a burden. I think, I think Paul, being probably far more um, spiritual than I'll ever be, he probably went straight to a burden. With me, when you see that kind of thing, you kind of, it's kind of the word stir your emotions, kind of stir within you, you go from, that's terrible, how can they do that? And you kind of get angry with things, and then you become a little bit saddened and burdened because they don't know God, and, and you kind of go from, they better not say anything about their religion to they need the Lord, and, and your emotions are kind of moved and don't really know what to do. But Paul, he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, and he was stirred. So, as Paul did, and as we should do, he did something about it. Verse 17, therefore he disputed, uh, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. So, he he wasn't starting a fight necessarily, but he went to the synagogue where he had a right to speak, and he went, and he went to the religious folks. I think that's kind of interesting. Maybe another thought for another day. But Paul saw in a mainly Gentile people, not following God, not knowing God, but having all these other gods, so he goes to God's people to deal with them first. And understand the Jews, most of them in that, in that day weren't probably saved, but they had the word of God, they had an understanding of God, but when he saw a group of lost Gentiles, of heathenistic people, he goes to God's people and deals with them first. If God's people get right, it'll make an impact on those around them. So he goes to the Jews and he deals with them, and then he goes outside of the synagogue uh, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Not just the worship place, but he went to the city. He went, to, he went outside and started talking to people as much as he could. But that doesn't last very long until people give him a hard time. Then verse 18, then certain, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So you can't help it when people don't like you. I worry about testimony and I do worry about things like that. But to some extent, if you do what God wants you to do, some people just aren't going to like it and people are going to fight with you. And that doesn't mean that you failed. To make people mad doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. So people made fun of him. They called him a babbler. You know, he's just talking nonsense. And then they accused him of... of creating more gods because he spoke of Jesus and the resurrection and the risen Savior. So, but the city was so deep in idolatry that all these other gods and thought that anyone could, I guess, just make one up, but that's what it seemed like at least, and they did that. But the story keeps going, verse 19, and they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is, whereof thou speakest is. So there's a, a not the Jews, but a religious council there of these Jews in Areopagus, that's where Mars Hill is, and he goes, and this council of religious folks are asking him questions. What are you talking about? For thou bringest certain strange gods to our ears. I'm sorry, not strange gods, strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. We want to know what you're talking about. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Paul, what are you talking about? What's this new God you're teaching? We've heard of all these other gods, we have all these, but what you're saying is new information. We want to know know about it. So then we get to verse 22. We'll spend most most of the morning here in the next couple of verses. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. They've got lots of weird beliefs, lots of religions. Kind of like having a lucky rabbit's foot. You know, it makes you feel better, but it doesn't do anything for you. Um, They have religious beliefs, but they're not real, truly biblical religious beliefs. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. The people of Athens, I think they were sincere. They were sincerely wrong. But they have this God for this, and this God for that, and that God, and this guy made up that God, and that guy heard of that God. So they had all these statues for all these religions and all these gods, probably thinking, well, if that, like a lot of religions are, um, like Greek mythology, kind of, and they're there, so um, they're in Greece. But this God for this, and this God for the rain, and this God for the dead, and this God for that part of life. And if you have all these gods, and you please them all, then maybe your life would be good. But just to make sure, and they're wrong, of course, but just to make sure they were covering all their bases and appeasing all their gods, they made one more, to the unknown God. In case they were upsetting one, they created one more. 
the unknown God. I think they were, again, they were sincere, they were concerned. I think they were trying to do what's right. That doesn't mean that they are right, but they're trying to do what's right. He mentions their devotions. They were highly devoted to what they were doing. But they were off track. Their false gods, like all false gods do, lead to sinfulness, and they lead to emptiness. They needed God, but they did not know Him. So Paul decides to use this altar, this statue thing, this altar, to the unknown God to make a point, to tell them who they don't know. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. So Paul says to that city, I'm going to tell you who your unknown God is. And while studying this week, preparing the message, I thought of our own nation, our own community, our own city, thinking our nation, at the very least, has an unknown God. Our nation, we have lots of gods. Some people brag about that, and I'm thankful for our religious freedom. Everyone, right or wrong, has the right to worship God as they please or to worship no God as they please. Every, people have the right to be, in, to be a Buddhist or a Muslim or Sikh or atheist or whatever. They have the right to do it. It doesn't mean they're right, that they are right, but they have the freedom to do it. But America does not know God. That's why we're in a mess. That's why our, we elect leaders that are godless, because our people are godless the one true God. So this morning I want to tell you about the unknown God. Again, my heart's desire is for those that don't know the Lord to know Him. Three things this morning. Number one, let's talk about the unknown God's person. The unknown God's person. In verse 24, he tells us, he says, Him declare unto you. So this morning I want to declare to you who God is, who the unknown God is. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He says, first of all, I want to tell you who this God is. You have this statue to the unknown God. You have this God to that guy, and this, God, or this statue to this God, and this statue to this God, and this statue to this God. But let me tell you, the one that you're missing, the unknown God, the just-in-case God, is actually God. The one that you're, just, just to make sure, he's the only one true God, and I'm glad you made that statue to him, because you would have missed the only God. But the God that you don't know is actually God. They missed the one true God. God said in Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Paul tells them, the one true God, he is, we'll deal with the details in a second, he is God, he is the creator. In fact, the unknown God is the only God. You don't need the altars and statues and ideas of all these other gods. The one unknown God is God. But he tells us, he says, the unknown God, his person, the unknown God is creator of all. God that made the world and all things therein. He's the maker of you. He puts you on this planet. He put this planet here. But it says he, he is the creator. He made the world and all things therein. He put us here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The God that people are missing today is the God that made them. The only God. The God that they ignore is the unknown God. He made the world, He made everything outside this world, the universe, the mountains, the seas, the animals, mankind, He made all of it. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing He is Lord of heaven and earth. Not only is the, the unknown God the creator of all, but He's Lord of all. He's Lord. He's Master. As creator, He's the boss, He's the master, the authority over all things, and one day He'll judge all things. The unknown God is the God that you and I will stand before one day. Whether you know Him or not, you'll stand before Him. The unknown God, verse 24, he says, Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Lost my place. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though He needed anything. The unknown God is creator of all, Lord of all, and is above all. He cannot be bound or confined to a building or to one place or one city. No one person has control of God for themselves. And in, in so doing so, no, no person can decide 
who God is and what He is. There's a lot of people that try to do that. They make God and what they think He ought to be, but He's not confined by any place or anything. I know that in the Old Testament that, that God would dwell in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and in the temple, but He was not confined to that place. That was not the only place people could pray. That was not the only place people could worship. That's where the sacrifices were made and the blood was brought, and God did dwell there, but God dwells in all places. He said, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he need anything. So many other gods, they, 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 you bring fruit, put it in a basket, put it in front, of their God, in front of their statue. You see that at a lot of Chinese restaurants and stuff. But they think, well, if you do this, you're, you will appease your God. God doesn't need anything. The unknown God, the one true God, he doesn't need you. We like to think that he does, but he doesn't need us. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our, he desires our things and desires all of us for him. But he doesn't need anything. He's all sufficient. Verse 26, the same thought. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He says he's made of one blood all nations of men. There's not an American God. Being on the mission field and getting to travel a lot of different places, some people, even in churches, get the idea that there is... There's an American God, there's an Asian God, and there's an Arabic God or whatever. But all God is, all, no matter what you call them, God is God. That's false. There is one true God. And just because someone has a, has a religious book doesn't mean that they're right about them. There is just God. All people, the Bible says, are made by the same God, have made of one blood all nations of men. And just as though there's not an American God, and there's not an Asian God or whatever, there's not an American Christianity. Christianity is supposed to be the same everywhere. People get the idea that, well, it's, that, that America has kind of invented Christianity. No, the Bible tells us what Christianity is supposed to be. There's no American Christianity. Sure, we have our culture and things like that that we kind of maybe add as an ingredient to it, but biblical Christianity is right no matter where we are. There's no white Christianity. There's no black Christianity. There's no Asian Christianity. There's just biblical Christianity the same way, there should be, the, people don't like this necessarily, but there should be no white churches, no black churches, just churches. A biblical church. When God created Adam and Eve, they had children. Everyone comes from them. And then there's the flood, and then everyone comes from Noah. We all came from the same place. And all, all people are to know and follow the same God in the same biblical way, regardless of nationality or culture. There's one God. It says, and have to determine the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God placed everyone where they are. Our sovereign God, who gives place for free will, also placed you in a world with a purpose and a plan. So the God that they did not know, He is God. <laughs> it's sad that they missed Him, but the unknown God, the one God they were missing, He is God, He is Creator, He is Lord. He's above all other gods because they are no gods at all. And He's the one God that we need. We find the unknown God's person. Number two, the unknown God's pursuit. Look at verse number 27. That they should seek the Lord, and if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. We find God's person, then we find God's pursuit. People need to know, regardless of where they are, but... You need to know who God is. But people often live in doubt of God's existence. Some people live carelessly, maybe recognizing that He exists, but pretending He doesn't, until they face a problem, a difficulty. They have to pray. They have to get a hold of God. So now God exists when they need Him. Some are fervently religious but miss God because they're turning to someone that is no God at all. But God wants you to know who He is so much so that he's pursuing us. It's kind of interesting the way that it's written. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. People are looking for God, but God is there so he can be found. In fact, God is the one that's pursuing us. These people here, they were very deceived. They're in darkness. They don't understand God. But I think the reason why they had all these gods is because they're truly looking for God. God puts something in our hearts to desire Him, to seek after Him. 
that people call the God-sized hole in our, in our heart, but people are pursuing truth, pursuing God. God makes it that way. They don't have to follow it, but people, or God is trying to be, um, God is trying to reach people that way. But they were deceived, and they were in darkness. But it seems like, to some extent, they were a little bit satisfied with where they are, but they still needed the Lord. But verse 27 again, that they should seek the Lord. The unknown God can be found. The unknown God can be found. That they might feel after Him and find Him. Some people are looking for satisfaction, but they can't find it. Maybe they're looking for it in drugs or alcohol or some sinful relationship, but God can be found. People invent other gods, but God, the one true God, can be found. I think these folks at Athens, they gave up too early. Someone brought them, eventually brought them the gospel, but I don't know if they heard it before, but just ignored it, but they're missing God. These were blind men walking in darkness in a world that could easily trip them up and hurt them. But God is there to be found. They might feel after Him and find Him. They're pursuing Him. God says in Proverbs eight seventeen, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. I believe God will be found of those that seek Him. The unknown God can be found, but the unknown God is not far away, He says. Though He be not far from every one of us. God's not hiding. In fact, God is trying to be found of people. He's not keeping Himself from you. He's not hiding the truth from you. Of course, God uses humans to bring the truth and bring the gospel to people. God uses, wants to use us to get to people. But God is not hiding, and God is not withdrawing from people. God is pursuing the lost, and God wants us to bring the, Him to them. Spurgeon said this about this text. This shows us how vain is all hope of escape from God. Where can we fly? Where can, he, where can we hide? What will we do? We've provoked him. The Lord will not at all acquit the wicked, Nahum 1.3 says. This is the solemn side of the matter. But there is a bright side to this truth of God's nearness. If God is not far from each of us, then how hopeful is our seeking of him? If I seek God and he is not far from me, I will surely find him. I do not have to climb to heaven or dive into the abyss, for he is near. Where I sit or stand, I may come to him. It is written, if thou seek him, he will be found of thee. And can I add this truth? <laughs> not only can you find him if you seek him, but again, God is seeking you. God makes people's lives sometimes difficult, so they'll pursue God. God, God sends soul winners to people so that people will pursue God. God does whatever it takes to get people to hunger for him. God is pursuing people. God wants to be found. God wants to save. God wants to bring people to himself. God wants to change people's lives. God wants to bring people from the trouble and the difficulty that they're in. God is pursuing people. And God said, if you seek me, you'll find me. People are trying to find him. I think Paul was an answer to their prayers, perhaps, and to their desires to get the gospel to them. But God is seeking after people. God has a hunger and a burden to save souls. God wants to save everyone that's lost. He's available. The purpose of Jesus, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. People, people think they can't find God. God is pursuing them. If they'll just obey what God says and listen to the Word of God, God can be found. Some people, don't, they hear about God, but they don't like God. They don't like what, how the Bible reveals God to be. They may not like His, His judgment. They may not like how He deals with sin or what He calls sin. But God reveals Himself for as He truly is, like Him or lump Him. Uh, God is what He is, but He can be found. God loves you and He cares about you and He wants to be found. He's pursuing people. The unknown God who is far above all things in power and majesty is pursuing sinners. But then one more thing, verse 28. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We find the unknown God's proclamation. I think it's interesting. 
Paul told these confused and religious people that the unknown God, he's of great power, he's the creator, he is the Lord, he is one, the one true God. For in him we live and move and have our being. He's everything that we need. We live, we have life on this earth because he exists. We have everlasting life because he exists. We move, we get through life because he exists. We have our being because he exists. And he uses this illustration, we are also his offspring. He made us, we come from God. But verse 30, in the times of this ignorance God winked at. That's an interesting phrase. What's he saying? For a long time, folks, you've not known God. You've allowed sin in your life. You've done things that are terrible and an affront to God's holiness. And God does not ignore sin, but God is long-suffering, isn't he? God does deal with our ignorance differently than he does our rebellion. The Old Testament, even under the law, if there was a different consequence for sin, if someone did that, not necessarily accidentally, if someone did something in ignorance, not knowing what the law said or didn't mean to do it, there is a difference between that and someone saying, I know what the law says, I know what God says, I'm doing it anyways. The fact, the, the fact that these people did not know God, God would still deal with their sin and God would still punish them. And if they died without Christ, they'll still go to hell. But God says, because of your ignorance, I winked at it, I was passive with it. I did not immediately and completely judge your sin. Is it wrong for people to, to worship false gods? Absolutely it's wrong. It's evil. Think of how God dealt with the Israelites. God didn't wink at their sin very much. They knew God. They had the word of God and the nation of Israel went and followed false gods in rebellion to the revelation of God they had. And God punished them. God was so patient. But these folks, they had all these false gods, I think because they're trying to find God, and God said, the times of this ignorance God winked at, you were ignorant. So I didn't punish you as harshly as I could. But now, things are different now. You know the truth, Jesus has come, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God has a proclamation, he has a command. No more time for ignorance. You have, the under, you have the ability to understand God, especially in the 21st century America. People that don't believe in God, they at least have an opportunity to hear about God. And I do understand there's lots of people that don't have the same understanding and the same opportunity. Not everyone lives in southeast Georgia in the heart of the Bible Belt and have churches on every corner. Not everyone knows about Jesus. I understand that. And things are getting worse in that matter. But God says the, tells us that the gospel is readily available. We know that. It's time to repent. If you have an opportunity, you must repent. You must stop what you're doing as far as their, their belief in these other gods and they're following these other gods. Paul says, stop trusting in these other gods and turn to Jesus Christ. Turn, repent, change your mind. And it's not a cleaning up your, of your entire life, but an understanding that you're lost, an understanding that you're religion, an understanding that your false gods can't do anything for you. Turn to the one true God. Turn to Jesus Christ. He says, you need Jesus now. And, and, and it's not a request. It's not just an offer. It's a command. It is a command to every sinner to repent. Turn to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for salvation. It's a command of God. And everyone not only has the opportunity to know God, but they're commanded by God to know God. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Why? What's, what's it a big, why is it such a big deal? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Judgment's coming. Your life will soon be over. And one day, God will judge this world in righteousness, in perfect righteousness, by his own perfect righteous standards. Every single person is a sinner. Every person deserves to die and go to hell. And God will hold you by that standard. God will deal with sinners righteously. And by the way, God will also deal with sinners righteously. Those that have trusted Jesus to be their Savior, their sins are forgiven. The punishment has been taken by Jesus, and God has already taken your place. He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Paul says God will judge this world. But you can be saved by the one that was raised from the dead. 
from Jesus Christ. Salvation is available. The unknown God, He's enough. He's done everything necessary for you to be saved. In Him we live and move and have our being. And that's not just for to live our normal life, but to exist and to exist forever and to live forever in heaven. The fact that we have Jesus Christ, we can, we, we, in Him we live and move and have our being. The unknown God is commanding people to turn to Him for salvation. Yes, God loves you. Even though you're a sinner, God loves you. He cares about you. It's, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants every, every single sinner to be forgiven and to be saved. But that is entirely up to you, whether or not you will come to God in repentance and faith, trusting Him to save you. The unknown God can be known. He's warning. He will judge the world in righteousness. Christ died and rose from the dead. You can be saved. The unknown God does not have to be unknown. For those in that day, Paul made the gospel available to them. I don't know how everyone responded. The Bible tells us that some, verse 32, some mocked and others said, we will hear the again of this matter. Some people listened. Verse 34, how be it certain men clave unto him and believed. Not everyone, not everyone will believe. But if you've heard the gospel, you now have an opportunity to believe and to know who the unknown God is. And if you know Him as your Savior, you know God. You have to live for God, follow God. To many, God is still unknown. I hate it, but along with our freedom, America, and I love our freedom, but America is a land of many gods and many false ideas. People in church this morning, they have a Bible and they know who God is to some extent. And while they claim Christianity, America as a whole believes in a weak God who did not create, but instead let us evolve. By the way, did you know this? If God did not create the world, as Genesis says, and man evolved, the man was not created by God, and man did not fall. If man evolved, we have no sin nature, and we don't need a Savior. So churches that claim that we evolved are claiming that we are not fallen creatures. If they're consistent, they're, they're very, very wrong. America, though, believes in a weak God who did not create. America, as a whole, believes in a God who does not judge sin and really doesn't care what we do, as long as we mean, we mean well. America believes in a God who does not hear and does not answer prayer. America believes in a God that can no longer do the impossible. America believes in a God that does not mind our sin as long as we try our best. And America believes in a God who does not punish people in hell. And America believes in a God that needs our help to see people saved. The God of the Bible, even in churches, is unknown. But you can know Him. You ought to know Him. The only way we can know God is through Jesus Christ and knowing what the Word of God says about God. The unknown God needs to be made known. If you don't know Him, so again, so many people, they, they know facts about God. American Christianity, that's again, not a, an actual thing, but what we could consider American Christianity has a weak, feeble God and a Savior that cannot save and do much for us. That is not the God of the Bible. The unknown God needs to be made known. If you don't know Him as your Savior, I'd encourage you to trust Him. Come to Him in understanding of your sin and of your guilt and turn to Jesus Christ to forgive you and to save you and He'll do just that. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again. He's able to save. If you'll just put your faith in Him. If you do know Him, make Him known. People will not know God unless you make Him known. We talked about that in the last couple of weeks. God needs us to make the gospel made available. And if you won't do it, God will find somebody else. But allow God to use you to get the gospel. Let's make sure our, our God is known.